More than three years have passed since our last African adventure, and in all likelihood, this may be our final one. The reason's simple. We're getting older, time is running out, and our bucket list is growing longer. With that said, Fred and I want to thank you for letting us share with you this incredible experience. Hey guys, how you doing? Today's the big day. It's the 16th day of February 2017 and we're getting ready to go to Africa. We're going to be landing in Nairobi, Africa right around uh, 20 minutes after midnight on uh, Saturday. Saturday. On Saturday. We're all packed and uh, once again we've done I think a pretty fair job of uh, condensing all of our stuff. He but has three bags to my one. Yeah, so they but say girls pack a lot. Yeah, but I'm packing a whole freaking TV stu yeah. studio. That's what he wants you to think. Did you pack the passports? You did. I did. You've got control over all documents. That's no, your I job. No, I don't. You were supposed to Friends take got them the out passports. Of the drawer. Friends got the passport. She's got the agenda. She's got all the important papers. Just fooling. I got them right here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, take care. We'll see you on the other side. Bye. This adventure will take us to the countries of Kenya and Tanzania. And if all goes as planned, we will be there just in time to witness the great herds of wildebeest and zebra who are returning from their annual migration. The first half of the trip will be spent exploring southern Kenya's Masai Mara, Lake Nakuru, and Amboseli regions, while the second half will focus on Tanzania's Kilimanjaro, Serengeti Plain, and the iconic Ngoro Ngoro Crater. We wanted this trip to be different, more up close and personal than before, so this time we hired our own dedicated vehicle and guide. Now we're going to be able to travel where we want and most importantly when we want. Those of you experienced in international travel understand what prolonged flight does to the human body. Suffice it to say, after 20 hours in the air, crossing 8 time zones, all the while cramped into a pair of undersized coach seats. Jet lag was going to be our initial obstacle. But hey, we get to do it all over again in three weeks. This is the longest single transit Fran and I have ever undertaken. I knew we'd be tired, but I didn't think we'd be this exhausted. After a nearly 16 hour sleep, we awoke somewhat refreshed. After a quick shower, change of clothes, we ventured out of the hotel to explore Nairobi's nightlife. Not such a great idea. It was around 6 p.m. The streets were beginning to fill with people heading out for the night. It didn't take long, for as soon as I whipped out my video camera, we instantly became the center of attention. I may have made a serious mistake. Okay, here we are in downtown Nairobi. First day in town, trying to get out, have some dinner, checking out the scenery and see what everything's like. It seems to be very, very crowded. And we got people sticking in, sticking their faces in everywhere. Jump on my friend, how are you? Okay, so now off to find the restaurant. Thank you very much. No, no, let's go. However, good fortune prevailed. We made it back to our hotel, had a good dinner, sipped a few scotches, and reviewed tomorrow's agenda. In the morning, we're going to visit the David Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage in Nairobi, followed by a very long five hour overland drive out to our first tented camp in the Masai Mara. So for now, it's lights out. While doing research for this trip to Africa, I was intrigued by a local attraction situated on the outskirts of Nairobi. The David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust is an elephant orphanage and is the home to hundreds of baby elephants who are rescued each year throughout Kenya. To understand why such an organization even is necessary, one must first understand the genesis of the problem. 
Each year, thousands of these majestic creatures are slaughtered by greedy, profiteering poachers who see the elephant's ivory tusks as their sole source of income. As technology becomes more sophisticated, so does the ability of the poacher to achieve their endgame. From the early days of poison-tipped arrows to today's use of helicopter gunships and chainsaws, poachers are wreaking havoc on the animal kingdom. Today, when visiting national parks all across Africa, visitors see paramilitary-equipped park rangers whose sole job it is to put an end to poaching. Their rules of engagement are very simple. Shoot on sight. Founded 40 years ago by Dr. Daphne Sheldrick, the Wildlife Trust claims a rich and deeply rooted family history in wildlife and conservation and is recognized globally as one of the most successful animal orphan rescue programs anywhere. Visitors and residents alike queue up daily for the opportunity to experience these wonderful creatures as they are nursed back to good health. Each day the elephants leave their stalls for their midday feeding and mud bath. It's as if the bell to recess has just rung and the herd of baby elephants thunderously make their way down to the public feeding zone. The keepers make sure that each elephant receives their proper allotment of milk and it doesn't take long for these toddlers to learn how to feed themselves. After their meal, it's time for a little recreation. And just like human kids, these playful pachyderms love to get dirty. While this might seem like kids just having fun, wallowing in the mud and spraying themselves with dirt is really a natural part of elephant survival. This is how the elephants protect their skin from the harsh African sun. After the public feeding has finished, the keepers lead our merry band of orphans back into the bush, where they continue to learn about what it's like to be an elephant. The keepers live with the elephants around the clock, providing their nutritional sustenance every four hours. In essence, they become their surrogate parents. But unlike real parents, the keepers rotate their attention to different elephants every 24 hours. This reduces the possibility of establishing a long-term commitment with any one keeper. I also like to suck on our fingers. Yeah. Yeah. That feel, makes them feel comfortable. It's like a pacifier. It's like a pacifier. Right? Yeah. But as we have all come to realize, elephants have a long and indelible memory. And on many occasions, develop strong bonds with particular keepers. Clearly a very human quality. And like clockwork, four hours flew by and it's mealtime once again. As we sit back and watch as these elephants are enjoying their new life, we can only hope that the poachers will experience their just reward and the elephants will live and grow old the way nature intended. We are at the David Sheldrick Elephant <coughs> Orphanage. The cutest elephants. The one that came over to me was only a year old. And you got to kind of pet them on the, on the head. They are adorable. And then some of them get mad at each other and sort of bumping each other. So this is a really cool place. Many Americans visiting Africa on safari do so from their plush, sterile surroundings of their Western-style hotel. Unfortunately, they will be missing much of what the Dark Continent has to offer. For the next two and a half weeks, Fran and I will be living and sleeping amongst nature, situated deep in the African bush. But it's not what you think. We're not going to be sleeping in cheap tents, eating roasted insects, or doing our daily business behind an adjacent tree. We are going glamping. The word glamping blends the words glamorous and camping together to create a completely new genre of outdoor activity. Glamping has become increasingly popular over the last several years. Yes, we will be staying in tents, 
but these are not your run-of-the-mill army surplus sweat shacks. These tented cottages are built on solid elevated platforms and include ensuite toilet and shower facilities, incredibly comfortable queen and king size beds, and they're all wrapped in luxurious Egyptian cotton sheets. And best of all, you get to fall asleep listening to the sounds of the hippos and the occasional roar of a lion, and then wake up totally refreshed to some of the most spectacular views on the planet. The glamping experience begins as soon as you arrive at your camp. All guests are greeted by the staff, wearing huge smiles, bringing good cheer, a well-needed moist towel, and a local beverage. From that point on, we all wanted for nothing. We carried nothing, and all we need to do is ask and we shall receive. Full room and board is included, and the food is great. Well, here's our lunch main course. This is called chicken biryani. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I can see some French fried onion rings on top, some potatoes, there's some rice in there, and there's some chicken buried way deep inside. Dining in camp is generally quite a treat. You have the option of dining alone or combined with other glampers. Fran and I prefer dining with other guests because we like meeting new people from around the globe and share stories from our daily safari adventures. When we're out on safari, our hosts pack boxed lunches for us. While not the greatest cuisine, it still was very substantial and held our hunger in check until we got back and had dinner under the stars. In the evening, following your dinner or just hanging out at the bar with the other glampers, it eventually will be time to head back to your tent. You'll be escorted by camp security, and for us it was a Maasai warrior. Glamping in wilderness camps are safe, but don't be stupid. Fences are few and far between, and it's quite common for wild animals, even predators, to visit the camp at night. Remember, we are the ones trespassing. So remember and follow rule number one. Once you are in your tent at night, you stay there. While our glamping experience thus far has been outstanding, into our dreams some crap must fall. Indutu is one such place. Perhaps we were just exhausted, maybe just out of sorts, or in Fran's case, the sickest she's been in 30 years. But the second we rolled up to this camp, we knew no way are we spending three nights here. We knew something was amiss. Indutu was not like other places we've stayed. Fran nailed it when she said this place looked more like a mobile army surgical hospital than a luxury tenting experience. There was no official greeting, no cool native drink, no cool refreshing towel to wipe the dust from our eyes. My God, what have we gotten ourselves into? But as it turned out, Ndutu was designed to be exactly what we encountered, a mobile safari camp and not a permanent facility. As the migration patterns changed, so did the camp's location, and what the guests gave up in creature comforts were more than made up in incredible animal sightings. After a refreshing hot shower, we walked across the camp to the dining tent, where we learned that Fran and I were the only guests staying at this camp. But to our surprise, the staff treated us like we were royalty, and pouring drinks from an open bar didn't hurt either. The next day, Rhino Africa came through as we knew they would. They booked us into a new camp called Kubu Kubu, located on the western edge of the Serengeti, about a five-hour drive from where we were. We rolled into Kubu Kubu around two o'clock in the afternoon. By that time, Fran wanted to die, and I just wanted a cold beer. Jumbo, Jumbo. Jumbo. How are you? You're welcome. <sighs> you Asante, Asante. Asante, something cold? Something beer. Ah, <laughs> you want beer? I want a beer. Okay. Hello there. Hello. How are you? Hot and tired. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh. Right. Oh, this feels so good. I mm -hmm. hope you enjoy. Now it's time for a beer. A beer? Yeah. A beer? Yes. You want to kill Serengeti? Serengeti, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Caribou. All was good because I got my cold beer, and Fran, who our gracious host referred to as Mama, told her to go to our tent, relax, and they were gonna bring her something that would make her feel much better. That something turned out to be a hot African tea steeped in fresh ginger and honey. The tea, combined with a well-needed nap, 
made Fran feel a thousand percent better within a couple of hours. Hey, Mama. How you doing? I'm okay. I'm comfortable. You're comfortable. You look comfortable. Yeah. They've been giving me tea and toast, and I even showered. This is better than a hospital, isn't it? Yeah, this is wonderful. And I've been here since 10 o'clock. And you got your animal wrap there? Yeah. And... I'm just listening to my book and wow. resting. For the remaining two days, the staff at Kubu Kubu took care of Mama like she was family. Fran and I have come to the conclusion that glamping was our preferred way of experiencing the dark continent. Having the opportunity to commune with nature while still maintaining a modicum of respectable creature comforts worked for us and it might work for you too. We live in precarious times. The Earth's climate is changing and is rapidly approaching crisis stage. As a result, the once great herds of animals that roamed our planet are dwindling, some to the point of extinction. And it's on that premise that this trip was undertaken. The Maasai Mara and Serengeti regions play host each year to one of nature's greatest spectacles, the Great Migration. Each year, mammoth herds of wildebeest and zebra follow the seasonal rains in search of more fertile ground, providing much needed sustenance. And it's during this time the herds repopulate to continue the circle of life. The highlight of any African adventure centers around the game drive. This is where curious groups of nature's voyeurs, like us, take to small, rugged vehicles, seeking to learn about the wonders this continent has to offer. These types of safaris offer us the opportunity to observe these incredible creatures in their own environment. Unlike going to a zoo, we're invading their space. We are the trespassers. We must play by their rules. Over the next 16 days, we will explore Kenya's Masai Mara and Tanzania's Serengeti Plain, home to lions, cheetahs, elephants, zebras, and hippos, and more bird species than you can ever imagine. And it's here we hope to see firsthand the vast herds of wildebeest as they return from their annual migration. We will be spending our nights at strategically located base camps located throughout the Serengeti. And our only means of transportation will be a Toyota Land Cruiser, specially equipped to accommodate photographic enthusiasts like ourselves. Our journey begins in Nairobi, Kenya, where we are introduced to our own personal Kenyan guide and tracker, Tom Kinyanzui. And as we're about to learn, Tom is a living, breathing encyclopedia on everything Kenyan. My name, Tom Kinyanzui. I'm a tour guide with Paul Man Tours. Today, I'll be out, going out with my clients for a safari expedition in Masai Mara, but it's my hope and my desire and crisscross all the areas in search of the big game. In Lake Nakuru, this is where we are sort of sure we'll be able to see a rhino because it's a rhino sanctuary. From Nakuru, we'll be heading south of Nakuru to Amboseli National Park. Amboseli is an arid area, and this is where we can be able to see big population of elephants in a small ecosystem. After Amboseli, we will be going to Namanga so that I can hand over my clients to my colleagues in Tanzania and they will be there for seven good days. Thank you very much and I wish you a good stay in Kenya, good continuation in Tanzania. We knew that getting out of Nairobi was going to be a challenge. We just didn't know how big of a challenge. Throw away that driver's handbook because driving in Nairobi is straight out of a Mad Max movie.
You never know what you're going to find around the next bend. Today, it was a fearless, lone baboon scrounging for food by the roadside. Showing no concern for automobile traffic, this pesky primate stood his ground as he devoured this Kenyan delicacy. Soon, we leave the quiet comfort and security of the paved road to begin our off-road experience. For the next week, it's going to be a gut-bouncing, ass-pounding drive through some of Kenya's most formidable territory. The cool thing about this trip, we have the flexibility to make our own schedule. Go where we want, when we want. It's just the three of us. It took about six hours, but we finally made it to our first base camp. Ashnomara, located about 500 kilometers outside of Nairobi. While we were able to view some animals on the drive out to the base camp, that was nothing compared to what awaits us inside the park. At Ashnomara, we are planning two drives each day. While the drive schedule will be routine, everything else won't. We'll never know what we'll see, when we see it, or what may happen when we do. It is life unscripted at its best. The focal point of the Ashnomara camp is the Mara River, which runs just outside our back door. Here, large herds of hippos congregate daily, languishing in the shallow waters or just wallowing in the mud. Our timing could not have been any better because we had the opportunity to watch one-week-old baby hippos bonding with mama. Oh, and one word of caution. As the sun begins to set, it is not uncommon for any of these two-ton behemoths to wander away from the river and into our camp. The incredible thing about game drives is that it's a total crapshoot. There's no guarantee you're going to see anything. But there's always hope that we'll be there to witness that fantastic Nat Geo moment where the fleeing Impala is caught by the lightning fast cheetah. But those shots are generally one in a million and are the results of hundreds of hours of mind-blowing boredom. For the most part, throughout Kenya and Tanzania, wild animals are protected and many live in the relative safety of national parks and game reserves. We're going to be visiting five such sanctuaries during this trip. While the animals are protected, these places are not zoos. Nature reigns supreme and survival of the fittest is the rule of law. The Masai Mara National Reserve consumes over 580 square miles of southwestern Kenya. With a peak altitude reaching 7,000 feet, this reserve is home to 95 different species of animals and 570 types of birds. Fran and I, along with our guide Tom, are crisscrossing the reserve for the next three days in the hopes of seeing things that are just impossible to see back home. While July through October are the best times to experience the Great Migration, our February adventure should not disappoint. While the both of us are really not cat lovers, we can gaze at lions and cheetah for hours, yet never grow tired. As cute and as cuddly as lions appear, they will kill you in an instant if provoked. While we didn't see any actual lion kills, we did see the aftermath. There is definitely a hierarchy within the Lion Kingdom. Mama hunts and brings home the meal, while Papa is the first to eat. Mama and the kids only dine after Papa's been satisfied, and the remains become property of the scavengers, mostly hyenas, jackals, vultures, who then fight over the leftovers. The metabolism of the cheetah is such that when they are not devouring their most recent kill, they're on the hunt looking for it. 
these terrestrial speed demons are continuously on the hunt to satisfy their ravenous appetite as well as that of their young cubs. Tom was telling us that the cheetah are extremely curious animals and seem to be intrigued by humans. In fact, there have even been reports where these frisky felines have entered safari vehicles just to check things out. Our Mara River base camp afforded us the ability to view hippos virtually any time of the day or night. Our game drives are all-day events that begin just after sunrise and end right around sunset. For the entire day, we are out in the middle of the African bush, miles from civilization. And when I say civilization, I mean civilization. There's so much to see here in the Mara, so let's just get to it. We're in the Masa Mara area, and uh, today will be our last game drive tonight until we head off to another area. Ashnell Mara is the name of the facility that we're at. Really nice place. And uh, as I said earlier, we are going to head out in the morning. I think it's about a five or six hour ride. So we're gonna be jiggling a lot tomorrow. Um, but then we start another area. So this has been a great trip. We've seen tons of stuff. Um, the only thing we were out today all morning, I think we were out from seven till around noon trying to find a leopard. They've spotted a leopard here. We even ran across some trucks from National Geographic trying to find this leopard. But we didn't have any luck, but we saw a lot of other interesting things. Maybe tonight we'll see a leopard. So uh, I'll be talking to you again tomorrow in a new location. This morning we're trying to find a leopard. People have spotted him a few places. Even National Geographic is here looking for him. But we're going to find him first because we've got Tom. And Tom is going to help us. About 45 minutes ago, we found out that there was a leopard sighting, about 30 minute drive from, uh, from where we were located. So uh, Thomas went ahead and uh, got us out here in time. And uh, all of a sudden, there's a ton of people that are just lined up in queue, waiting to see the leopard. You can't see a whole heck of a lot. It's a big cat, though. He's up in a tree. And uh, we're going to go check him out. Although the Maasai Mara Reserve is home to the African elephant, over our three-day visit, unfortunately we were unable to spot a single pachyderm. But not to worry, because there was so much more for us to see. As you've already seen, this area is teeming with big cats, and for a very good reason. For the lion, leopard, and cheetah, the Maasai Mara is simply the largest, natural, all-you-can-eat buffet anywhere in the world. Home to several antelope species, which include millions of impala, topi, eland, and waterbuck, there is a near endless supply of food to satisfy these ravenous predators. Zebra or as they're pronounced here in Africa, zebra, are everywhere. But the one question nobody can answer, and that includes Google Tom, are these animals white with black stripes? Or are they black with white stripes? Regardless of what I can tell you is like fingerprints on humans, the stripe patterns on zebras are unique to each individual animal. Baboon populate the Maasai Mara in great numbers. This family-oriented species normally travels in packs, but on occasion they get out and explore by themselves. Unfortunately, at times they find themselves in a bit of a sticky situation. 
you would think by now they're aware that lions are able to climb trees. But after 10 minutes watching and recording this simian standoff, I got bored and so did the two lion. We all left the area and our lone baboon climbed down and rejoined his family and friends. You know the old adage, there's strength in numbers. Here, surrounded and supported by her family, is a little baby baboon having a great time taunting a female leopard. There are two things that we can surmise here. The first is that if that leopard tries to hurt that baby baboon, you can be assured that entire troop will descend on the leopard and tear it to shreds. Or, in all likelihood, the leopard has just eaten a large meal, is fully satisfied, and that baby boom is merely after-dinner entertainment. Game drives offer us a unique perspective on the lives and living conditions of these wild animals. While I love to view these magnificent creatures, I will never do so by visiting a zoo. Personally, I find zoos abhorrent. But having the opportunity to see these creatures in their own setting gives me a deeper appreciation of life in general. Watching the wildebeest and zebra brave the crocodile-infested Mara River so they can feast on new grasslands, or watching once hungry lions sleep away the day as their bellies digest their huge meal from the night before, or spy on the hyena and jackal as they scavenge for food gives us all a deeper appreciation for the circle of life and just how fragile it really is. With that said, our time in the Maasai Mara is now over. We're off to Lake Nakuro National Park. Thank goodness, I think we've made it through the worst part right now. We're into a section where we got some relatively solid road in front of us. So we're, uh, we're shifting gears and we're getting out of here. After an excruciating six hour drive from the Maasai Mara, Fran and I have finally arrived at Lake Nakuro National Park. This is going to be our home for the next day and a half. We chose Nakuro because this was probably going to be our best opportunity to view rhinoceros, specifically the nearly extinct black rhino, for it was in 1987 that this park was designated a national rhinoceros sanctuary. Black rhinos have been on the endangered species list for many years. Their population once exceeded 70,000, but poaching and sport hunting reduced those numbers to less than 2,400 by 1995. Thanks to the conservancy efforts like those fostered by the Kenyan National Park Service, the black rhino population, while still in danger, is making a comeback and now today claims numbers in excess of 5,400. With its focal point being an 18 square mile soda lake, Nakuro offers a completely different experience than what we had while we were in the Mara. The lake's high alkalinity forms the basis for its extraordinarily high levels of algae, which just so happens to be the main food source for flamingos. It is not uncommon to see massive flocks of these pink and white birds inundating the shoreline. Don't let the name fool you. All rhinos are gray in color, not black or white as their name suggests. While both species look similar, their mouths tell the difference. The mouth on a black rhino is pointed, which allows it to eat low-hanging fruit from bushes and trees, while the mouth of a white rhino is flat and wide thereby allowing it to graze more easily on grass. So if they're the same color, why are they called white or black rhino? Well, in all likelihood, in the African or English languages, the word vide or wide was used to describe the rhino whose mouth was wide and grazed in the grass. And probably over time, the word wide was mistakenly understood to be white. Ergo, the name white rhino has stuck. Another way to tell the difference between the two species is that the black rhino is extremely aggressive, much more so than the white rhino. However, don't use that as a determining factor because by the time you find out you've encountered a black rhino, it might be too late. 
As a result of rising water tables, the highly alkaline water has killed off virtually all the trees and bushes that once lined the lush shoreline. On the day we visited, the sky was lightly overcast and hazy. That, combined with the starkness of the landscape, made Lake Nakuro seem rather creepy. Although the lake's water is not drinkable, the area is peppered with many underground springs that create small ponds that supports the park's wildlife population. Okay, so now that you know all the nitty-gritty details about Lake Nakuro, let's go check this place out. For the next five days, we will have transitioned from Kenya's Masai Mara to Tanzania's Serengeti Plain, and we'll have explored both the Amboseli and Serengeti National Parks. After leaving Nakuro, we endured an eight-hour cross-country transit to Amboseli. This trek took us over mostly dirt roads filled with an ample supply of bumps and enough dust to choke a horse. On arrival at the Amboseli Gate, our guide Tom left us to take care of some paperwork, but not before warning us of the aggressive Maasai vendors who were extremely eager to sell us their handmade trinkets. His advice to us? They are relentless, and the word no is not in their vocabulary. Tom knew exactly what he was talking about. We finally reached Amboseli National Park on the southern end of Kenya. By contrast, Amboseli is extremely different than all the other parks we've been into so far. This place is dry, very arid, and it's pretty much all desert, at least from what we can see so far. However, two huge underground aquifers fed by snowmelt from Mount Kilimanjaro spawned several swamp areas right in the middle of the desert. These wetlands are host to an amazingly large array of aquatic birds, elephants, and hippos. No matter where you are in Amboseli, or for that fact, the northern Serengeti, Mount Kilimanjaro always seems to be in view, provided it's not shrouded in cloud. Almost every time we turned around to take pictures of animals, there she was, the largest freestanding mountain in the world. And imagine how incredibly awesome your day is gonna be 
when you open your eyes in the morning to see the majestic wonder of Mount Kilimanjaro. Arid lands can produce strange weather events. In the American Southwest, these tornado-like clouds are called dust devils. In Kenya, the Maasai refer to them as Shatani Wavumbi, or literally translated, the Satan of Dust. They can spawn and dissipate in an instant and rise to more than 100 feet in height. The good news is, while they may be abrasive to the skin, they're relatively non-destructive. With over 400 different species of birds that call this area home, most of the bright and colorful ones we encountered were found mostly in and around the swampy areas. while the birds of prey and scavengers went anywhere there was a potential meal. A few days later, we crossed the border at Namanga and entered Tanzania. Had it not been for Tom guiding us through this labyrinth of bureaucracy, who knows where we would have wound up. I wasn't allowed to go ahead and uh, videotape crossing the border. They've got restrictions against that. But we finally made it across the border and paid our $100 uh, per person visa entry fee at the Namanga Crossing. So now we are officially inside of Tanzania. Unfortunately, we were still a three hour drive from our next overnight stop in the small town of Karatu. Today was another long day, lots of driving in this trip. I'm sure I look just wonderful from either sweating or hair everywhere, but um, this new t place that we're at is the Roteo Tented Lodge, which is in Tanzania. Uh, it looks it looks rustic. Man, it is rustic. It's pretty rustic. Uh, but it's the kind of place that uh, the electricity doesn't go on until 6 o'clock at night and they promptly turn it off at 11 o'clock. So this is one of the places where the electric is very limited. Every other place we've been in Kenya, we were lucky enough to have it all night. This, this location is, is kind, it's kind of unique and we, we are enjoying it, but it is a heck of a lot more rustic than other places that we've spent. Um, we're only spending one night here. It's pretty rustic, more rustic than we're used to, but still, very nice, very doable, and then we get to look out into the valley. We're only staying here one night, so it'll be very interesting. Welcome to our first place in Tanzania, and I'm sure we'll shoot a little more of each place we go to. Following an incredible night's sleep, we awoke to the understanding that we were in for another very long and grueling eight-hour transit to the Serengeti. While similar topographically to the Maasai Mara, the Serengeti offers much less swampy areas. It is here where we hope to see a vast assortment of wildebeest, zebra, several species of antelope, and of course Cape Buffalo. Tom tells us that we're also very likely to encounter several big cat sightings, including lion, leopard, and cheetah. Because this was going to be such a long drive, our tented lodge prepared a boxed lunch to cover us for this long transit. My only regret? I sure wanted a nice cold beer. But hey, no problema. A cold one was only four hours away. For several days, we made our way across two of the largest game reserves in all of Eastern Africa. We saw it all. Let us share with you now the animal wonders of the Amboseli and Serengeti National Parks. By now, you've heard of the term Big Five. In a nutshell, this group represents the five most popular animals to seek and record while on safari. We were very fortunate to see all five while we were in the Serengeti. The most elusive of this quintet is the leopard. You never quite know when and where they will show up. One morning I spotted two trucks parked off the road in a restricted area. It turned out they were National Geographic photographers in search of a leopard. We kept driving so as not to interfere and screw up their shot. I'm glad we did because, as it turned out, we found a better angle to view the elusive cat. And like all good guides, Tom put the word out to other guides in the area to notify them of our sighting. And in just a few minutes, 
others are able to come and share the splendor of this incredible animal. Lions rest during the day and reserve the cool nights for hunting. A few even like to take a leisurely stroll to help with their digestion. So it's not a big event to see lions gathered in a shady area during the day. While most prides are small in numbers, generally five or six lion, today we came upon a pride of 17 cats. Even Tom has never seen a pride this large in number. With just about two hours of sunlight left in the day, we discovered this loving couple. It's obvious by the collar on her neck that this young lady is being scientifically monitored. For over an hour, we sat quietly in our truck and observed. I found it quite interesting that the female was the initiator when mating. Little telltale signs like the flip of a tail or the licking of her paws seemed to send a message to the male that it was time to get down to business again. During our hour of feline spying, this couple managed to mate on average every 12 minutes. And we're told that this can go on non-stop for more than 24 hours. But enough's enough, time to head back to camp. After witnessing firsthand the incredible work done at the David Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage, it's good to know that these magnificent animals have nothing to fear from the poachers or the hunters when they reside on this protected ground. Watching them live their life the way nature intended is a feeling that can't be replicated anywhere other than seeing them live in their own natural habitat. Buffalo is a unique species of bovine. While it's been tried in the past, this animal cannot be domesticated, unlike its Asian counterpart, the water buffalo. This makes the Cape Buffalo an extremely dangerous animal and is known to gore and kill over 200 people each year. Other than humans, the Cape Buffalo have few predators, with the exception of lions and large crocodile. And unfortunately, being a member of the Big Five, the Cape Buffalo is a sought after trophy for hunters. Although there are five distinct species of rhino, only two reside in Africa, the white and the black rhino. The sad fact is these beautiful animals are hunted and killed by humans for both sport and for their horns. Rhino horns are bought and sold on the black market and cost as much as pure gold. Thought to have medicinal value, rhino horns are made of keratin, the same type of protein that makes up hair and fingernails and have absolutely zero medicinal benefit. Yet, affluent consumers in countries like Vietnam, China, and Thailand think otherwise. With the Big Five now out of the way, we were able to turn our attention to all the other incredible animals surrounding us. It's hard to imagine that such gangly-looking giants can be this graceful. They are absolutely fascinating to watch. Necking can be both a part of courtship, or in this case, one male staking dominance over another. And when it comes to a good meal, you can't pass up a good thorny acacia tree. When we see a hippopotamus, we normally see a gentle two-ton giant that loves to languish in water or in mud. But what you may not realize is that these salad-munching beasts are not only excellent swimmers and capable of holding their breath for up to five minutes, they are blisteringly fast on land too, running up to 19 miles an hour. When you see a hippo, there is really only one rule to follow. 
Leave it alone, let it be. How can you not look at these cute little puppy dog-like creatures and not want to snuggle with it? Well, for starters, the jaws of a hyena are so powerful that they can crush the bones of your skull. These 100-pound-plus canines can run up to 37 miles an hour, hunt in packs, and are capable of bringing down a two-ton Cape Buffalo. There is nothing they can't or won't eat. While many of the larger breed animals living in the Serengeti can fend off their most common predators, this is not true for the wildebeest. It seems that they are a major dietary staple for lion, leopard, cheetah, hyena, wild dog, and even crocodile. Their only real protection comes from traveling in large herds, and then it's the stragglers who are generally picked off by the predators for a quickie meal. So you think you know a lot about zebras, huh? Well, the old adage that their safety in numbers could be the zebra's motto. Zebras seem to like the safety and security associated with living within a herd. And for those of you who think that a zebra's stripes are just for identification, you better think again. A zebra's stripes are known to deflect nearly 70% of the sun's rays, keeping the animal quite cool during the heat of the day. They also provide camouflage in tall grass, and some scientists even think that the stripes even help to ward off insects. And now for the coolest zebra factoid yet. While these horse-like animals cannot be domesticated, many zebras were taught to pull chariots way back in the day of Julius Caesar. So there you have it. Everything you wanted to know about zebras, but were afraid to ask. You can't truly experience the Serengeti without first indulging yourself and your budget to a dawn excursion in a hot air balloon.